Hi, what the health tech listeners. I'm your host this week, Mark Fuster. This is the podcast where we tackle some of the trending topics, ideas and best practice in health and social care. This week, I'm speaking to Helen Hughes, CEO of Patient Safety Learning. Helen's passion for improved patient safety came from personal insight into the impact of unsafe care. An experienced leader, Helen has helped many leadership roles in companies such as the World Health Organization, Equality and Human Rights Commission, and the Parliamentary Health Services Ombudsman. Um, Helen, if you wouldn't mind just kind of maybe just telling us a little bit about yourself um, to begin with and be kind of, you know, what, what do you do outside of work? <laughs> yeah, so you, you'd <laughs> ask me that question. I'm glad you didn't ask my husband that question because it's like outside of work. It, it is my passion and it's, uh, you know, I, I, I do have a bit of a work-life balance challenge, to be honest. But um, what I love doing, I love music, uh, like going to live gigs, um, listening to music. I've got friends that are musicians, so we go we go see them play and kind of join in, hang out, a bit groupy with a band. Uh, yeah. Love uh, outdoor activities, so walking. Husband and I had a week walking uh, 60 miles of the Pembrokeshire Coastal Pass uh, in September, and that was fantastic and a, a great switch off uh, uh, and relaxation. So chilling, uh, anything that involves eating and probably drinking a little bit too much red wine. Sounds oh, all that sounds great. Um, what was what was the last gig you went to? Uh, oh, Tedeschi Trucks. Oh my lord, wow. they are they are one of the greatest uh, blues rock bands in the world at the moment, and they gig in Europe maybe once every couple of years. And we saw them at the Palladium last uh, Friday, and it uh, I had to I had to put the tickets I think back in May. And they were, they're a 12 piece band and they kind of started going into a bit more of a jazz funk thing. So right. astonishing. Yep. Look them up. Tradeshi Trucks. And they've got a yeah. female uh, lead singer, guitarist. Uh, it's a husband and wife couple. And uh, Derek Trucks, uh, Susan's husband, is probably the best slide guitarist in the world. So check I out. have never heard of them, so I will, no, I will definitely check them out. What's, your, what's, <laughs> well, your, what's the best? What's the best gig? Ever, I know this is a horrible question. What's the best gig you've ever been to? Uh, ooh, probably the first one I ever went to when I was seventeen, which was the Stranglers. Nice. So, yeah. It was a bit of a punk thing, uh, but yeah, no, they're all they're all so amazing. I, and we we do a lot of folk festivals as well. So as we get older, a bit more sedate, but uh, just love live music. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same. I've gone from kind of Glastonbury to Latitude. That's kind of you know. Yeah, yeah, I've done Latitude with the pink sheep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes it, it's a bit more sedate though. Um, <laughs> uh, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining us this week, Helen. And I'm actually, I'm just going to jump straight into the first question. Um, so the podcast about P Surf. Yeah. Um, and I guess for me, kind of the question would be why, why the shift from kind of serious incident reviews to PSERF? Why, why do you think we're doing it? And, and what's the benefit that you think it'll, that it'll give? So why it's needed, and this is my language, not, you know, the team, uh, yeah. the great team at uh, NHS England, Tracy and, and uh, Lauren and, 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 well, it's a very small team, <laughs> but uh, the early adopters and others. So that, you know, the, the, the official line for why we're doing it, it, it is not described in this way. But for me, it's our approach to incident investigation has been a bit uh, like being on a hamster wheel. So we, mm -hmm. we've been doing this kind of repetitive approach to incident investigation. And a bit like the big inquiries and reviews, we spend more effort and energy in trying to do the diagnostic side. And we're not actually translating that into learning that is applied for action and improvement. So we're not, we haven't worked as a healthcare industry. This isn't just the NHS. I think this is a kind yeah. of global perspective of not turning that into, into action and improvement. And, you know, the scale of avoidable harm really hasn't significantly shifted in the last 20 years, which is shocking, really, given how much effort and energy and activity that has been. Some of it's very successful, but it hasn't made that transformational change. So the kind of the idea that you would uh, look at, you know when things go wrong and obviously there's we might get into the discussion about safety one safety two how much you can learn from when there isn't harm when there are near misses or you can learn from good practice that's that's something that's increasingly recognized that we need to do more of but the learning from when things go wrong if we're not doing good quality investigations and getting real insights into causal factors then we will be 
we'll be ticking the box, but we won't be making the change. And uh, I mean, if you look at, you know, because we've we've invited people to do investigations without properly training them, you yeah. know, they come up with conclusions that are, you know, more possibly more blaming of individual and performance and then just inviting people to, you know, make fewer mistakes, you know, uh, be more careful. You know, it's it's not yeah. it's not hidden where we need to be. So I mean, do you think last, that's it then? Sorry, I know last go, go point. There is a <laughs> huge culture change. So I think yes. Pete Surf is a tremendous approach, but it is part of that more fundamental transformational change we need in our industry to prevent avoidable harm. So, to, to, to if I've understood the point properly, that bit about historically, or even now, to be fair, because people aren't yet moving over, that investigation, that process is more a, ends up being a blame culture, which I think is is not necessarily down to the the process, it's more down to the culture, um, mm. and that cycle or that mechanism of being able to take what has happened in an incident and then learn from it. I mean, I, I would I would argue that actually there's probably a lot of organisations now who, including NHS organisations, whose incident reviews currently include lessons learned, feedback mechanisms, feedback loops. Mm-hmm. And yet, as you say, actually, if you look at the trend and you look at the, you know, the, the number of incidents, actually it's not moving at all. If anything, it's probably going up. So why, mm-hmm. why does this specifically change that so I, I, I you mentioned training and you mentioned people being able to hold an investigation properly and I know there's lots of different mechanisms of doing an investigation mm. within PSERF but is this so just challenging it a little bit is this not just you know changing it from doing one process to another process and actually the bit that's missing isn't necessarily the process it's really the the skilling the upskilling of the individuals involved in that yeah, no, no, I think I think you're right. And and but but I would challenge the you know, incidents going up is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, um okay. counterintuitively as it it is. If you've got a more open culture and you're you're supporting people to raise concerns, you know, patients doing that as well as clinicians, um, saying that something's gone wrong or could go wrong or has gone wrong and the, the, the extent of it. You know, if if people are in a blaming and quite toxic culture, they're not going to put their head above the parapet unless they feel that there's a, you know, the trade-off is the risk of them reporting to the risk of them not reporting. So you, you've got to encourage people to report and you've got to give them the environment, the tools to report. They've got to have the time. Yeah. They've got to have the tools that enable them to do that in a way that is proportionate and, you know, maintains um, the, the commitment to an increased reporting on the basis that reporting leads to learning. But I think the 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 guidance that came out in August from the PSERF team actually really framed it right that this is a cultural change and that the first thing you need to do is to look at how you're doing interview, you know, investigations, reviews, however, and, and move to that assessing what are the risk profiles in your organization so inviting organizations to take a planned approach rather than as you say very very process focused and saying you know this incident or you know had this kind of severity therefore you have to follow this process and trying to take it away from it just being a mechanistic process and stepping back and saying actually what is the culture that we need to have for learning and for improvement uh, and, and implementation of that improvement. So I think you've highlighted one of the big risks there, actually, uh, because the, the 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 risk is that you just move from one process to another with a different set of tools. Yeah. And and my 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 worry about this is not the intention of PSERF. It's about the the implementation and and the team at NHS England have provided resources, tools, guidance. They're working very collaboratively with HSIB on on training. That's super. But from an organisational perspective, and that's what we do at Patient Safety Learning, we hear a lot from people that are in the patient safety front line, in this case staff, but but often also patients. Hmm. And it's kind of what does the implementation process look like within the organisation? And and I think the PSERV team recognise that. So they've not sort of said, oh, you've got three months and you have to implement it. This is a kind of phased introduction. But our organisations, do they have the, the leadership capacity, the expertise, the commitment 
to make that transformative cultural change with new processes to support that. And I think it would be great to have more of support for that implementation process within organizations rather than this is what you need to do now down to you. Yeah. What does it what does that look like from an organization's perspective? How can people share their experiences? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think I've seen the same, to be fair, because, you know, being part of the forums, um, obviously with kind of a slightly detached view as a provider. So the deadline is relatively close. You know, it's autumn 2023. And then almost as you said, there's, there is roadmaps for want of a better description of here's how we think you're going to get from A to, to uh, B. But in terms of who's going to help you, who's going to support you, who's going to help you with the training, who's going to help understand what these, you know, if you, thematic reviews, for example, if you're not, if you've never done a thematic review before as an organisation um, or an after action review, they're, they're not something that you can just suddenly switch on. There's a whole mm. host of things that you need to understand before that, you know, what's the best practice behind it. And I think that that's the bit that I, again, with that kind of outsider looking in, yep. see, well, I see how there's a switch between a process, but I don't see how you're necessarily helping these organisations to be successful. I guess the early adopters are good evidence of it is successful, but it feels to me like maybe there needs to be that additional support. So is there anything that, you know, anything that you would recommend that NHS organisations should look for in terms of, you know, I was saying they're having to help, they're having to almost get there themselves. What, what should they be looking for? I think some of them are doing, some of them are doing this now anyway, but, but for me, the way I would describe it is the your you're changing the operational model for patient safety within organizations yeah. how how and that that requires commitment from leadership um, uh, knowledge sharing communication within the organization it requires people with expertise uh, people with capacity to do things differently uh, you you're probably aware that we we support the amazing patient safety management network that is yeah. led and um, uh, it is led by people working in patient safety and supporting each other. So it's a it's a peer support network, but it's also a community of interest. You know, probably maybe even could describe the community of practice where people are, and that's nearly eight hundred members now in, in over mm-hmm. a year that the that the founding members of it have 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 created. And what that that group is doing is bringing in people that are actively. Uh, implementing this so some of the early adopters some of those organizations that and and individual leaders that are actually implementing these tools and saying how do i do it how can i bring in others that have done it what have i learned from it and and i think more of that is kind of needed so some of it's quite tacit in that it's a it's a it's a knowledge sharing but i i i i and I, but I think at an organisational level, and often I do think in terms of organisational systems, that's kind of our our our, our yeah. focus a lot on in patient safety learning. It's about making sure that you've got that whole organisational plan for this, because this is hugely yes. significant. Yeah. I mean, it's a massive, massive change. It's a it's a revision and a step change in the right direction, in my view. But it, it's it's not something you can just leave to a few patient safety managers and they, they'll do their investigations differently. It, it, if that's the way it ends up, it won't have the benefits that are intended about that sort of culture change and improvement. And, and there was a really interesting insight I got from one of the patient safety managers that that is um, is on that group. And I was talking with her and she said they'd had a they'd had a patient safety team away day. And they were exploring about their role and rewriting their job descriptions, because actually, rather than doing serious incident reviews, you have to do things within 30 days, 60 days, send it off to the CCG, all of that. You know, this is a fundamental rethink. And they were exploring about their role and their capacity and how they would be prioritizing their work. And some of the team were like, this is so exciting. This is what we've needed, you know, and we we should be encouraged to all become, you know, masters in human factors and healthcare. You know, that's the level of expertise and support that we need to be able to provide the organisation. And then some of that team were like, well, we've been doing this for years and I don't want to change. Yeah. That's what I like doing. So some of it's about reskilling uh, and uh, reframing what, what's done. And, and given the inordinate pressure that the NHS is under at the moment, I don't think anyone has seen the like of, of the pressure of, of activity and, and, and the workforce capacity issues 
there's no good time to introduce changes and these are changes that are needed but i i, I think it, it would be it, it is needed if i was within in a leadership position within an nhs organization i'd be yeah. wanting to pull together plans resources you know really investing in people making this change and I, and i do worry that even though there's a kind of years lead in time and then there's transition whether that there will be um the capacity to respond uh, and then there will be if it's not picked up people will might get disappointed and cynical and this is just a replacement one process with another so it's the behavioral change side the organizational capacity the leadership uh, and one of the things that we we did uh, patient safety learning um about five or six months ago um and we shared it with the patient safety management network but not, not broader was we did a, a risk assessment of PSAF and and looked at the aims the goals the ambitions and what were the what were the barriers what were the risks in not achieving it and therefore what mm -hmm. organizations needed to do and i've got an inkling that that might be worth now updating that the guidance is out but uh, but actually putting that um, out there to, to, to sort of say, you know, your implementation planning needs to include these things. Uh, and, and some of them are out, outside the organization and some of them are really complex, particularly around the patient and family engagement stuff. This is not quick fix mm. territory. Um, so let's, let's kind of roll it forwards and let's pretend the culture, pretend the cultural thing's been fixed and, you know, every, 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 yep. <laughs> yeah, right. the, the, the process is in place. You kind of mentioned at an organisation level, so I'm going to say at an organisation level and then at a national level, do you think the mechanisms are in place? And it might be, obviously, with kind of a, you know, me with a software you know, provider hat on, are the mechanisms in place to help with that kind of cycle of how do you learn, improve, not just at a, almost from a kind of a ward level right the way up to a national level. Do you think the systems are in place there to help support PSURF in a way of here's all the amazing stuff we're finding out, here's all the lessons learned, here's the things that we can do differently, and here's a model which you know may or may not be repeatable across different organisations. But how do you think people will share this? Yeah, which obviously, yeah. you know, come away from just being, I'm going to report how many incidents I've had to NRLS to actually now I'm going to be talking about his, I'm sharing my learnings with, with, with the, the, the wider community. What, what does that yeah. look like? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't know, if, I mean, if your viewers will be familiar with one of the big pieces of policy work that we did when we first set ourselves up as patient safety learning, and we looked uh, and we reported um, with a document called the Blueprint for Action. And we, we tried to answer the question, which is 20 years on from to Eris Human in the US and Organization with a Memory in the UK, um, you know, outlining why a systems based approach is needed. And we got a better understanding of the causal factors of, 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 of avoidable harm. Why aren't we? Why, why haven't we made that transition? Why haven't we achieved uh, those substantial changes and, and reductions and avoidable harm? So we, we, we tasked ourselves with coming up with why is harm so persistent? And, and mm -hmm. we reflected on that in terms of, you know, safety isn't a core purpose uh, of NHS organizations. People say, you know, safety is in everything we do. And then they kind of have a separate strategy that sits in the corner, you know, getting on with, it's stuff, but it doesn't kind of inform core business in the way that other safety critical industries would. And one of the foundations that we identified at the time, the six foundations for, for safety, because we collated resources, research, inquiry reports from around the globe um, and, and, and reflected on the organizational foundations that were needed and shared learning was one of those. Yeah. And, and uh, healthcare seems, uh, there are very, very challenging ways that healthcare organisations and clinicians and others learn, and you know, the volume of uh, of knowledge around healthcare is expanding almost exponentially. How do you keep up with it? But really, in relation to the topic, uh, the, the, the specificity of what you've asked, you know, there's a re we highlighted this real challenge. Organisations don't learn within organisations. You could have superb practice in one. Yep. If you look in an acute hospital, you know, one ward is brilliant, another ward 
just doesn't apply it you know so we've got i mean you know the cultural stuff is still there but you've magic magicked away the cultural problems it's it's kind of how do you translate that knowledge across and i think some of that is through having having clear standards having a standards framework for for all sorts of things but having a standards framework for for shared learning how do you do it what are the models of good practice what are you doing as an organization how are you collecting data how are you managing your performance how are you inviting people to share their experiences and that's translated not just within an organization but but nationally and and our response at patient safety learning to contribute to that was yeah. to recognize that it's not always easy to find insights into kind of risks and challenges but also good practice and that's kind of the, the you know the heart of why we created our knowledge sharing platform free knowledge sharing platform the, the hub which now has i don't know 12,000 pieces of content discourse peer reviewed literature blogs, insights from reports, inquiries, all sorts. Uh, now viewed well over a million times. Um, we had we had a blog that we put up about uh, vascular um, implications of COVID for with information and, uh, for physicians and patients. We put that up there last Thursday and it went yeah. viral. We've had, I think, nearly 12,000 views of that. 60% of those are from the US. So I, I think I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I think the challenge is how do you get that knowledge of risk and harm and improvement w across organizations and more across uh, across systems? I'll give two, two examples, if I may. One I think is really interesting in terms of, we've been working very closely with Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital on our standards framework that we've developed and are, yeah. uh, and are implementing. And we've launched now formally, but, um, They've, they've restructured their senior patient safety team, much more emphasis on quality improvement. So how, how you take the knowledge from incidents and then the learning and how you apply it. So you've got that learning cycle, but they've appointed to a, a role that I don't think I've seen anywhere else, which is head of patient safety surveillance. And, uh, you know, it's kind of that surveillance kind of language is a bit public health observation type language. It's really about how do you know what you need to know to make improvements, either within the organization or externally. So really kind of investing in how do you learn? How do you know? How do you inform your education programs and your delivery programs? So that's at a local level. I think at a national level, um, your participants may be aware of the role that we've been playing in coordinating the views of uh, local risk management system leaders about uh, the LFPSE changes and 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 um, some of the challenges people have and the changes they want to see. But I think there is much more work that is needed and it's recognised nationally, but it mm. needs to happen and it couldn't happen soon enough to have an integrated approach between what's happening on LFPSE, which is a kind of replacement to the National Reporting and Learning System, and PSIF. So how do you how do you capture the knowledge? How does that inform local learning? And how does that then get translated nationally? Because capturing information on incident reports is valuable and it will enable the national team to do the plan is that they do a better um, they can do more data analysis and they can spot trends or issues early and that's what they want to do but actually how does the learning if you're doing a thematic review on pressure ulcers and you've developed an improvement program and you're doing that at you know an acute hospital in bradford how does that information get out and inform what someone wants to do in scunthorpe you know yeah. and, and and there doesn't seem to be those mechanisms for for sharing that and, and it's strange as well because the systems there i mean we are well, I, i'd argue we've got one of, one of those systems yeah. um but those mechanisms for the share for sharing does exist i think yeah almost back to that you kind of mentioned kind of lfpsa p sims the the facts uh, piece of sorry the fact that they're not necessarily kind of joined up i always find surprising as well it's almost like you've got two two diff slightly different agendas but actually ultimately they're all working towards the same thing and the fact that from an end to end the system's not necessarily being thought about from again from a systems perspective 
that always surprises me when suddenly it's, oh no, here's, a, here's we're implementing X and then suddenly Y comes up and then there's something else and it's like, why are these not joined up? Why is that? Why is this not? A, why has yeah. this not been thought of as a whole? Because the problem's a whole problem. It is, and I think I think I mean it kind of reflects the 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 remit, possibly the remit and scope of the national team, really. In that yeah, they are they are delivering a series of programs to achieve component parts of that national strategy, and you know that's perfectly legitimate kind of role for them and how has it been defined but looking at it as I said earlier at the lens of how you implement you know within an organization you're going to be you're going to need to knit all these things together as part of an overall framework and so if you've got different initiatives coming down slightly siloed that's that's not going to be helpful for you at a local level because you you're going to have to integrate those and make them work and and that kind of i suppose that's the whole concept around what we were recommending in the in the blueprint for action is that you need a standards framework for safety for safety system thinking safety management and 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 at an organization level you need an integrated approach that looks at you know what you're doing around culture what you're looking at metrics how are you sharing learning how are you doing investigation how are you engaging with patients and families at the point of at the point of care if things go wrong and improvement all of those are part of a uh, a, a safety safety management system and a safety framework uh, and and therefore uh, we would argue that having a set of standards that define what good looks like will be a really important framework for organizations to then go okay we we need to we need to assess ourselves against what good looks like and we need to make improvements but we can use the, this kind of framework to prioritize that activity so what you're doing is you're building it in as a say as part of the safety system as part of the dna of the organization rather than yeah. it being a set of separate initiatives and it's what Don Berwick uh, the ex-president of the IHI is called out uh, he doesn't use this language but it you know safe patient safety shouldn't be a set of separate initiatives initiativitis it should be a whole organizational system framework and that's what we we've suggested and that's why we've developed the standards in the way we have but but back to your point I think if you don't have that designed from an organizational implementation perspective then people will struggle to, to, to map and marry the various things together. They're going to have yep. to knit it together at a local level and everyone is going to have to do that knitting independently of each other, which is why, you know, uh, vendors, yourself and others, the more you can do to integrate that, the better, the more that there are knowledge uh, mechanisms like, well, I, suppose I would argue the hug, but, but probably really importantly, like the patient safety management network, like whatever you know, the patient safety specialists do. The more to share that learning, so that everyone is not having to reinvent the wheel all the time. I, I, and I think that's what uh, that's a bit disappointing. I think nationally is is mm -hmm. not is not uh, not looking at it from the lens of how you implement, uh, and that that's a big gap. Yeah, I think we we see the same thing. You 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 end up with these things just bumping up against each other when actually they should just be complementing each other, and yeah. you, you cause yeah. frustration and and you know difficulties for implementing it when actually they don't really need to exist. If if you would have taken that step back and had that joined up you know view, I, I think we'd be in a much better place. So the recent patient safety congress was a fantastic opportunity to learn more about PSAF, um, and as a movement towards um, improving communication when things go wrong. So. Dr. Henrietta Hughes, OBE, said, Investigations are not the only method to answer a family's questions. PSAF offers the flexibility to help organisations speak more openly with families and answer their questions. So how do you think NHS organisations can ensure they engage more with families as part of the process? Um, and, and is there any view on how you think maybe a digital system could support that? Yeah, so I, I, I think one of the, the, the six foundations that we'd identified in our blueprint for action was around patient engagement. And as I said to an earlier answer, that we described that at three levels, uh, at the point of, uh, point of care, of shared decision making, um, the patient and family engagement, if things go wrong, uh, and how they're engaged in you know, getting the wisdom and insight from their experience to inform what's gone on and 
you know, rightly in terms of Gigi Akanda, and, and then linking into the accountability that a healthcare system has to provide safe care and, and how patients and families' insights can improve, uh, make, make system and service improvements with, with their insight to make it a, 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 an integrated approach. And I, I, I come back to something, a, a comment that Ted Baker made in conversation with me a few years back, which I think is profoundly important. And he said, patient safe, we won't, we won't have patient safety in, uh, and, until we start thinking about the patient and family being part of the clinical team and, and we yeah. break down those barriers. And that's a, that's a relationship issue. That's a power dynamic issue. That's an information sharing issue. So, so I think I've been having this conversation with uh, Finn, who are, um, uh, uh, what does it stand for? Private Healthcare Information Network, and they're they're a, mm -hmm. a publicly funded body um, to provide information across the independent sector. And uh, talking to Ian, who's their new CEO, with doing some work with them, and of course they they very much uh, are in that place to work and are accountable to the Competition and Market Authority about decisions that patients are making. So in the independent sector, it's it, you know very much patients as consumers as well as patients. And so it's quite an interesting lens to look at of what information do uh, you know, um, patients need in order to be make, making those decisions on cost effectiveness grounds, but also on quality grounds. How do you choose your organization? How do you choose an individual clinician? And some huge challenges uh, you know in the context of uh the patterson inquiry and the gruesome um uh uh, tragedies, uh, you know, in in the Midlands from the completely unnecessary surgery on women that were were not unwell, yeah. and those that did have breast cancer were not were not treated uh, well enough, and you know, are dying as a consequence of the poor care. So, so really quite complex issues. So, I, I introduced that because I think if we were to think of and, and patients are much more than consumers, but if we were to think about a com consumer focus, you know, we'd be much more actively engaging with patients and families. How was it for you? What did you want? What was your experience? And I, and as a as a as a patient myself, but also as a as a carer of a of an elderly mother, it frustrates me enormously that my perspective on her care and some of the challenges she has to access care across multiple providers and that it's not geared around her you know patients are having to join the dots for their own care you know my insight into that could really help make improvements in the delivery of care to her but to other elderly people will you know complex um, conditions and I, I don't get a voice in that really very much you know I can make a complaint I don't want to make a complaint I, yeah. I I want to be engaged and be able to provide that insight if I want to do that and there are there are places we can do that I mean I'm going to mention care opinion who I'm a great fan of you know they're a uh, uh, you know, they provide a technology platform for people to provide feedback to organisations, um, you know, positively celebrating the good care, but highlighting poorer care. And, and it's a paid for service. So, you know, it, it, it enables clinicians to respond back. Um, and so there are there are kind of, I think, increasing there could be digital platforms of ways of capturing that data so you know when you the intention with lfpse uh, is to have you know a more effective patient reporting module well the nrls e form for patient reporting is as rubbish now as it was when i was involved in helping set that up 20 years ago we've not really moved further on and I, I don't think we've really thought through how the insights we're getting from patients and families as their experience of care but also the safety of their care that there's a wealth of insight we get and I, I, I don't I think we're really at a very early stage about doing that and I'm sure I'm sure there's ways of doing it you know we work we work very closely with patient campaigners, particularly some of those that were involved in the Cumberledge review, the IMMPDS review. So I've got a meeting with uh, Henrietta Hughes, the new patient safety commissioner, this afternoon with Kath Sanson, who's, um, who's, who runs the Sling the Mesh uh, campaign. They've got a Facebook group. Yeah. It's a peer support. It's a private group, peer support. They've generously allowed me to, to 
to be a member of that because I can contribute to it, but I can also take their insights. And with Kath and we, we write blogs and we, we promote stuff. So, but, but with social media, just a better understanding of what the risks and concerns are that we're not seeing, the outpatient hysteroscopy campaigns that we, we support. You know, these are areas where there are significant safety issues for patients that aren't being picked up by the mainstream health service because there's there's no data, there's no research. So when when people raise concerns, clinicians say, well, we don't, we don't see there's a problem. There is no evidence of this. Well, the evidence is the personal testimony of, of, of harmed patients, but they're not being listened to. So th- there, have to be, there have to be mechanisms that we can learn. I mean, you know, uh, last point on this one, if you look at the East Kent inquiry uh, into maternity services and pretty much all the previous inquiries, they would not have come about had they not had tenacious patients and families yeah. fighting for information and justice. It shouldn't have to be... Um, the the you know the system should be able to learn from patient engagement and experience without having to turn those into uh, exhausting campaigns and then formal inquiries. We we should be doing this as routine. Yes, I think it's the fact that patients are having to drive that is yeah. you know it, 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 yeah, you're right, it shouldn't happen. I, the, the bit you mentioned about almost a consu- you know patients as consumers. So I've just recently been to the US. And obviously, very different healthcare model, which yes. I am in no way saying we should <laughs> we should try and follow. But one of the things that they do get right is obviously, from a patient point of view, you have a choice. You know, your your, your insurer is insuring you, and you have you know these different hospitals, for argument's sake, where you can go off and, and get treatment. And so the patient care there, or that the patient experience, is almost utmost in those hospitals' minds. It's from the from the moment they come through the door. Um, so one of the examples I had was uh, City of Hope, which is um, in California. They just built out a brand new hospital, and most of the um, kind of people in the area were kind of Asian population, Ch- Chinese, and they had no number four anywhere in the hospital. So it was treating it was a cancer hospital, mm-hmm. basically because for, for the translation for number four, and apologies, I've got this wrong, but the, poly, the the translation of number four into Chinese basically is similar to the word for death. Mm. So from their point of view, their their customers, their patients are in that particular area. They tailored the whole of the hospital towards ensuring that they got a better experience. You know, right down to that level of detail. It was completely patient centric mm-hmm. rather than being clinician centric. And and I think we 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 we're, we're almost the other way around. As I say, we don't really we don't necessarily listen to the patient at all. Really, I would argue in a lot of in a yeah. Lot of cases. What I what I would. I mean, I remember having a, a, a conversation with the then chair of the CQC and he said, well, you know, uh, healthcare uh, in in the US will be safer because it's a private model. So they will compete and the, the hospitals with the better safety record will be more successful. I'm not sure there's much evidence about no. that. So that's <laughs> right. I, yeah, I, think, I think you're right about the patient engagement and the, the consumer experience. That side of it, it is important. I mean, I, you know, in the States, if you don't, I mean, the, you know, the politics has changed since I, when I worked at WHO, I was out there when there were Republican presidents and, you know, since they've been Democrat presidents, they've put more investment into sort of Medicare and Medicaid. But the quotes that at the time, it was like there were 40 million you know, US citizens that had no health insurance and in effect, no access to health care, you know, other than emergency care. And and that was yeah. shocking. So I think that has improved there. But, but I don't think from my, and I'm not an expert, but I don't think from my experience, there's any one model that is, is, particularly better for for safety but there are different levers of challenge and change and some of those are financial levers some of those are cultural some of those political and policy levers and and so it, it i don't think you really point out any one healthcare system that's kind of safer because of the the, the system that they've set up or the you know the the kind of governance model of how they run their industry uh, yeah. but it is back to those things in our blueprint and and they are core to the now who global patient safety action plan i mean i had the opportunity to contribute to that in a kind of stakeholder expert engagement kind of way and there's there's a meeting 
in Geneva in a couple of weeks a time to look at the implementation of that global plan and, and what have member states done to 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 implement that so it'd be really interesting to learn you know how people have taken forward some of the uh, opportunities to think around safety as a system uh, and what they've been doing. I mean, obviously, in the intervening time since when they produced the plan, 2019, you know, we've had a, a global pandemic. So that's kind of, you know, focused people's attention quite heavily on, on, on that. And therefore, there may be less progress in some of the areas that, that people would have planned for. But it will be it will be really interesting to see how other health systems have uh, have done that, and, you know, hugely impressed by the approach it's taken in japan spain do a lot you know there are there's there's much learning from other member states and how they how they do this and and some of the global programs on patient engagement are uh, 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 are inspiring and transformative um and you know there's much opportunity for for the nhs to to learn from those so you know it's that porous nature of knowledge so yeah you know, how do you how do you capture that and and bring the best of it into each and every member state and the organizations within it okay brilliant i think um in, in terms of the conversation around peace i think we probably you know we could keep going um there's lots and lots and lots to cover um for now, I think I'm going to ask you the what the health tech moment. So at the end of each episode, we ask everybody to describe their what the health tech moment. Uh, the question uh, for a bit of fun, and we basically want to hear weird and wonderful stories you've experienced in the health and social care industry. So I don't know if you had anything you'd like to uh, share with us. I've got a bizarre one. Um, which is, <laughs> Bizarre's good. Yeah, I don't know. It's not so much health tech. It's more a kind of information security kind of issue. And I have told yeah. this before, but it is bonkers so um i was in rwanda as you do yeah. <laughs> um, uh, as the health lead um for a, a who meeting on infection control so it was chaired by the minister of health for for rwanda who is a uk trained pharmacist great guy and it had uh, infection control experts from the whole of sub-saharan africa so oh, i don't know 100 people chief medical officers super brilliant people um very mm -hmm. important meeting and i there was a presentation from the uh, from from the minister and then i was responding on behalf of who before we went into a couple of days of workshops with lots of experienced technical experts in areas that I have no knowledge about, but I was there in a kind of leadership and kind of diplomatic capacity. And just before yeah. I did my presentation, um, one of my uh, WHO colleagues from within Africa uh, said, could I, um, could he copy the uh, slide deck? And I sort of said, well, you know, that breaks you're not supposed to put these things on um, memory sticks and whatever. He said, oh, no, it's all right. It's fine. So I, um, I, I went oh, okay so I, I did that downloaded it and when I when I went to do my presentation and I press play I got live soft porn <laughs> <laughs> it was it just, no, no comment <laughs> I mean, it's just absolutely I mean it you know my it tested my speed reaction and it obviously closed it down within you know a nanosecond and I had the presence of mind to say I've got no idea how that happened. You know, you must have a virus on your memory stick, um, you know, because I wanted to make it clear that this was not mine. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was just embarrassing. Uh, but, you know, and I can yeah, I can imagine. And I and I, mean, I I broke information security. You know, I I knew that he shouldn't I shouldn't have done that. But I kind of went, oh, it'll be fine. And and I had the most loveliest reaction from all the clinicians they all came up afterwards and gave me a huge hug and they were just so sweet about it but you just think you know no it was just all <laughs> just all yeah, i bet that's just, the uh, most difficult bizarre way to learn that lesson yeah it's the most bizarre one i i doubt if you'll get another one of those no i think you're probably winning i think that's definitely the one <laughs> that's, that's the, one, the most bizarre one i've heard I, I could laugh now but that was about 10 years ago and it, you know literally cold sweats in the middle of the night when you think about that it was yeah. just awful and the, the minister of health was just very sweet he was yeah he was very kind <sighs> yeah shivers. right well I, I don't know i don't know quite where to go after that so um <laughs> I, i'm gonna <laughs> I'll just say thanks for joining us this week and, and thanks to everybody for listening. Um, join us next week for a new episode and don't forget to rate and subscribe. And if you've got any questions for us or our guests, uh, please email whatthehealthtech at radarhealthcare.com. Thank you. Thank you.